Welcome to Between the Lions, Jeffrey. Everybody, it's so lovely to have Jeffrey of the Bo Morris Conservation Society and has fingers in many pies. Jeffrey, maybe we can just start with you telling us a little bit about yourself and how you got involved with the Bo Morris Conservation Society. All right. Um, I uh, grew up in Bo Morris uh, as a baby. I was here before the Second World War. And uh, it was interesting why Bo Morris was actually uh, not uh, built on or of interest to uh, Estate agent. Bo Morris was different because it had never been good for farming. It had been sandy, uh, hilly, ups and downs, a lot of old sand dunes, and it was too far away from a railway line. There was a Sandringham line which ended at Sandringham, as the name suggests, and the Frankston line uh, went bypass Bo Morris because Bo Morris stuck out a bit into Port Phillip Bay. And the other thing about Bo Morris was it didn't have any nice sandy beaches. Not like uh, Aspendale and Edith Vale and Morty Alec. So there they really enjoyed the beaches. They built lovely stone walls along the edge of them and concrete footpaths and rows of light posts so people could stroll along at night all lit up. And that did mean that some uh, foreshore vegetation had to be removed, but that's the price of progress. Meanwhile, in poor old Bow Morris, it just sort of languished. One other reason was, of course, that the um, Dunlop Rubber Company had bought um, over, well over 100 acres of Bow Morris at dirt cheap prices during the Great Depression to build their new factory and move from their, their one at Port Melbourne. Never actually happened, even though they had great front page news about it in August 1939. The reason it didn't happen was that on the 1st of September, 1939, the Nazis moved their troops into Poland. And three days later, the Second World War began. And while the Second World War was going, nothing much happened to Bo Morris, which was pretty good for Bo Morris conservation. And when that all finished, people realised it was great for housing. There was an expanded population, baby boom. Troops were all back now doing what uh, they'd put off during the war, having families. But fortunately, they they found Bo Morris was cheap land, $50 a block, what now costs routinely $2 million. Now, they had no water, no laid roads. And it was still rather charming because there were trees along the edge of the roads and the, a group of people thought it was really amazing, lovely vegetation, uh, managums, uh, casuarinas, tea trees wattles, and heathland. And they campaigned to keep it as much as possible. They realised people can build houses, but they argued for keeping the surroundings. And in those days, the houses were relatively small because the money wasn't there after a punishing war effort of five years. And most of the houses were small. So that not only achieved its ends. That's why, to some extent, you'll notice more vegeta- indigenous vegetation around Bo Morris. And it's also why, once the society began in 1953, and you can see all the minutes of the general meetings that the society held since 1953 on its website, you can learn by clicking on them under records just what things they were talking about in those days. The Coast was always important because developers, even though it was Crown Land Reserve, had managed to have all sorts of things in other parts by uh, offering to build them and as long as they got the um, income from the operation of them. It remained Crown property. And our, uh, on our website, we have a high-resolution aerial photo of 1951, which shows the interior of Bermaros, um in some cases, large swathes of bushland or heathland, uh, but they'd been nibbled about around the edges, found there was a good opportunity to have a market garden, and none of the roads were constructed except Balcom Road and Beach Road. Beach Road had been constructed fairly early, and uh, it was uh, 
very pleasant as a young kid, and I had nothing. I'd never heard of the Beaumaris Conservation Society, and under or even under its former original name, which was Beaumaris Tree Preservation Society, uh, until I um, heard about it in the 19, late 1960s when things were underway very seriously. We've got a, a later aerial photo there, part of Beaumaris, and you can see the difference between 1951 and the 1960s. Now. There are mixed opinions. There's some people who just wanted to replicate uh, by Morris as any other suburb and make it a proper suburb. <laughs> Others didn't. And there have been attitudes like that ever since. Uh, one very striking uh, proposal was in 1964. But before that, before I come to that, I mentioned something that actually happened and still there, and we have the effect of it to this day, but it, they tried to expand it again in, uh, in the last 10 years, and that's the Beaumaris Motor Yacht Squadron. The Beaumaris Motor Yacht Squadron was formed on an area that turned out later, was recognised, but not championed at the time, unfortunately, because people came too late to it, the motor yacht, or they're really powerboat operators, with a euphemism, motor yacht, um, they got a lease on the area of Crown Land foreshore and seabed and were allowed to dump huge quantities of waste material there to build their clubhouse and their um, boat ramps. They fortunately didn't want or didn't get permission to build boat storage. They wanted that. That came later this century. But back in the 50s, they built what's there now. And the, there was virtually no one to stop them. The, um, it's later been realised, and, and the, the, we're paleontologists of the day, of the day to, that recognise that as one of the greatest fossil sites in Australia. It, it has features that combine land and sea fossils so they can date things better. It's very exposed, and there are a great number of uh, fossils obtained from there legally uh, and in the Melbourne Museum. Our second president was a major fossil collector and is recognised even by having a, um, a fossil named after him, the something or other McRae I. That was uh, Colin McRae. Uh, what happened then? On oh, 1964, I mentioned this was a, a real watershed because although people had uh, argued for better retention of trees and streets and not have them all bulldozed out of the way, the council of the day, the predecessor of Bayside City Council, uh, had a, a real anti-tree mentality. Uh, they didn't want trees on people's land. They didn't want them on the streets. They were just in the way. And so the uh, character who was the city engineer and, and mainstay of the time uh, made sure that as many as possible were, were gone. So there was a fight for everybody. I even remember being in the witness box of the Supreme Court of Victoria once. This is by the time I joined the society, back in the early 70s, um, defending uh, trees, which are still there, fortunately. So there were people who... Uh, Which trees are those, Geoffrey? Sorry, can you just tell me what street they're in? The, well, there are various streets. And the best example of street trees, left in streets, and an, uh, the way Beaumont was, was Point Avenue and Coral Avenue. So much so that the last Liberal government of Victoria had a planning minister called Matthew Guy, who you've probably heard of, and he he created a and accepted a uh, zoning requirement for those two streets that they their special natural landscape atmosphere, including their the land abutting them, the freehold land, was to be a significant landscape overlay. Come up this 1964 event, which is a, yeah. a big, a really big thing that that the Morris Tree Preservation Society. Uh, Launched, and this is before I'd even heard. I was still a teenager, and was more interested in other things that teenagers are. 
<laughs> they had a massive meeting at the Bermorris Community Centre to oppose a proposal for what was billed called an oceanarium at Ricketts Point. It was go out into the sea on the rock uh, platforms and on the, the dry land, and it was to have great car parks and entertainment centres, cafes, a real fun fair to have a look at things and have tanks and a big aquarium type thing. I don't know whether they proposed to capture any dolphins or anything, but certainly they they were dreaming big. And Bay Morris wouldn't have any of it. <laughs> it was highly unpopular. And even the Balti government, which was not known for being a uh, conservation-minded government to say the least, it uh, refused permission. So that that brought us up now to when I'd actually got involved in 1969, I joined the society, and by then we had a bit of a revival in the society because there, there all these small societies have ups and downs. They go up and down in membership. And people move in and out, lose interest, and they join when there's something that particularly concerns them. But it's still useful to have an ongoing society with a bit of experience and record. That's what we've tried to achieve. Um, in 1970, we decided the, the, that oceanarium experience it was a, a wake up. That, and the fact that we hadn't, or nobody had done much about the Bamaras Motor Yacht Squad, and that shouldn't happen again. And it just broadened its outlook, changed its name to Bamaras Conservation Society because the land forms of Bamaras, the so sand dunes, the cliffs, the beaches, were also important, the rock platforms. Uh, it's a place where you can see so many different birds on the coast, as well as inland birds in our heathland reserves. And we were involved, uh, as from 1960, in leasing our heathland reserve. It was a, a, an acre of bushland, and actually heathland, in Grimatton Avenue, it's still there, called the Grimatton Avenue Heathland Sanctuary, and it was leased for $10 a year, that acre of Bermorris land, to Bermorris Conservation Society for maintaining it, which we did for 30 years. Can you just tell me a little, just a little bit more about the um, air, the conservation areas around Bermorris? I heard you mentioning the rock platforms and the heathland, because when I look at Bermorris, I see Ricketts Point and, and the beach. That's kind of what strikes me as the conservation success story. But as you've just said, there's that heathland that you've preserved for 30 years. Well, first of all, let's look at the uh, areas of land. Uh, the biggest single land holding in Beaumaris, what's now called Beaumaris, has actually been in the one ownership since uh, 1770, which is quite a long time to <laughs> keep the developers at bay, uh, and th that ownership has been the Crown, namely the Foreshore Reserve. It's uh, well over 100 acres uh, from one end of Bermaris to the other. Then there are other areas which are primarily council land, although there was a big area that the Education Department had uh, where the Bermaris Secondary College now is, and just south of that was land that was originally probably acquired for the, the college if it wanted to expand, but it was decided that they had enough, and the uh, Victorian government um, dedicated that southern part to conservation, <coughs> kept it as Crown land, and it's now managed by both sides City Council as the Long Hollow Heathland Reserve and it's well over a hectare. There two, that was the best area of, 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 of undisturbed, relatively undisturbed heathland in Bermorris, along with a smaller patch the further uh, west at Grimatton Avenue. I mentioned that earlier, the acre there. And there was a great gift that was bestowed around about the time of the First World War by a man who was so interested in the natural quality Morris. He was a journalist on the Melbourne newspaper called The Argus, which no longer exists, but it was a long-running Melbourne newspaper. That land was six hectares, which is a significant area in suburbia, 
It's still six hectares. It's got a football over at one end, unfortunately, and a pavilion and various skateboard ramps and other stuff. But the other end is, the other half is monitored for conservation. It was bequeathed by Donald McDonald, the naturalist writer, because he so loved the place and it's managed fairly well by Bayside City Council at its eastern end. It's called the Donald McDonald um, Reserve. The final one that of significant, real significance is Balcom Park, which is on the north side mm. of Balcom Road. Balcom Road is, has a long history too, which you'll find on our website, but you've got to explore it because it's not always easy to find. And Balcom Park has a, a small oval on it and it's had other proposals, including that skateboard ramp I mentioned, which we fought strongly um, earlier this century and finally got it in the least harmful place. Uh, It has great heathland. If you want to see Wedding Bush, which is a a delightful uh, Bob Morris heathland species, which is very hard for people to regrow. It it doesn't like being uh, planted. So where it's left and grows on its own accord, it flourishes. So that's how the the, uh, citywide, the group that manages the reserves for uh, Bayside City Council, that's where they've got a great uh, heathland reserving and walk through parts of it too. It's well worth a visit, Balcom Park. I, I know that usually little the conservation societies fight a, a, a losing battle against developers and and um, the, the demands of a growing urban environment and so a lot of the stories are sad stories but I'm sure you have in your history a couple of campaigns that you fought that are can be regarded as success stories could you tell us a little bit about that yes well there have been small ones of course uh, <laughs> success is saving this tree yeah. saving that tree nature's trip tree or a, a front garden tree that somebody wanted to remove but um, the community didn't but but all counts, I think the biggest success was one that took over ten years because in two thousand and eight, the Bermudas Motor Yacht Squadron announced that it because it had a particular commodore who was really keen on having a hundred berth marina built over what was remaining, what they hadn't already covered of the Bermudas Bay fossil site. Now, fortunately, by this century, the paleontologists of the world, and some of them were extended in other parts of Australia, the United States, for instance, was one of the leading world paleontologists. He was well aware of this fossil site and what it meant to science and history. There's also the landscape qualities. The Morris Cliff is Mm. uh, quite a long uh, stretch of vertical cliff, not common on Port Phillip Bay. Some people might like cliffs, but scenically they're very important from further south. People of Morris actually don't see their cliff very much, and some of them are probably not very aware of it unless they walk along the foreshore path because uh, it's concealed from uh, view because it's a cliff. It's on the side of the uh, landscape. It's vertical, not horizontal, and nothing much grows on a vertical cliff. However, uh, it's got a geological history of importance. Apparently, it's been there for about 10,000 years since Port Phillip Bay sank and was flooded by incoming uh, ocean. There have been various sea level rises, and we're told there might be more in the future. Some people think they might be very large and threatening. But anyhow, the Morris Cliff has survived, uh, but it was damaged in 1953 by having a road cut down through it. And I remember how sad I was as a teenager to see all that lovely area that had been vegetated and was a lovely coastal walk just covered with concrete and building and a road down so people could take their boats on trailers. Fortunately, we didn't store them. But by 2008, the Commodore and his... um, majority he had on his committee wanted 100 earth 
thing with with boats up to six meters long. That was the maximum, and there were a hundred, and that would have gone well out into the bay with uh, rock walls and uh, extra car parking, and it's just the last thing we wanted on this beautiful piece of scenic coastline uh, covering fossil sites. So that was the campaign that went on. We were just strung out about this because there were successive governments of different persuasion, Liberal, Labor, etc. But fortunately, none of them seemed to want to actually give them the, the uh, Commodore what he wanted and his cronies. We campaigned against it. We knew there were people in the motor yacht squadron who didn't want it, and they actually had a, a ballot of it, and they found that they said they would keep going if they got more than three quarters of the vote, and they got just over three quarters. But there was a minority of 25%. But we keep, kept campaigning. The most community didn't want it. That was obvious. They, they couldn't show anyone other than boat owners who came from various places, not just by Morris. And gradually that minority grew, and eventually the cost kept mounting because the motor yacht squadron had to do various studies, environmental studies, etc. Both sides the council eventually voted unanimously against it. It got a, an environmental significance overlay over the area proposed, the only one in um, Bayside. Then numbers grew and the, uh, the board of the Matthew Squadron was voted out and new one. In. And I think at one stage the treasurer said he'd, after spending over half a million dollars on this, they didn't want to use any more members' funds on this dream. There we go. We uh, we won that one, and we hope that that's a permanent victory. They're still there, of course, uh, as they were from the 1950s, but they, uh, their limits have been declared, I think. And, and so still... that overlay that's been declared will protect that area now? Look, the planning scheme is subject to the, ultimately the decisions of the Victorian Civil and Administrative Tribunal known as VCAT and they seem to allow more or less anything. They do stop some things, and we've been had a habit of going to them and uh, appearing before them with little hope of uh, success. Every so often there's an occasional success. A recent example of VCAT and uh, tribulations with it was a proposal in Point Avenue. I mentioned Point Avenue. There's an area of original... Uh, road where the, the vegetation was there, the no curbs and channel was just a, a strip of bitumen, a dead end, so it's a, not a high traffic area at all. It's only got half a dozen houses in it, or not much more. Anyhow, a fellow who uh, had uh, great ambitions for uh, his dream house there had the means to do it. He was only in his 30s, but he had become very... Uh, um, affluent by his occupation in the United States of uh, being a basketball player. He was said to have been earning 16 million US dollars a year for a number of years. And he wanted, he, he, he bought two adjacent blocks. One we know he paid 3.7 million for, and he demolished the house on that. That was actually the house of a, a second president. Had died by then. His widow had finally died at the age of 99 and was put up for sale. He demolished that and he bought the one next to it, which had views of Port Phillip Bay. He was planning to demolish that. He had to go to VCAT to do that. And VCAT really, we, we spent hours at VCAT and uh, we had over 60 objectors. Uh, VCAT only reduced his plans very slightly. He wanted to have a, 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 an underground garage for 16 cars because he was a car collector. He wasn't going to use them all, but he was a car collector. We suggested that he hire a factory somewhere in one of the industrial areas and he could easily drive out to uh, Braceside or Moorabbin or Sandringham even to look at his collection when he wanted to. But no, he had to have them there apparently and he above them, which has been a half-size basketball court and a swimming pool. Now, with a big house to replace what was already there, 
VCAT virtually didn't do it, but he had second thoughts, and I think this is to his credit, that he realised that this wasn't popular. He reconsidered it. He said he'd go and buy somewhere in Queensland. This shows how the planning scheme isn't really the idea. We, we managed to persuade, and you've got to persuade both the council of the day and the planning minister uh, to make some changes to the planning scheme. We've managed to do that in, in, in uh, terms of what's called a vegetation protection overlay for by Morris and Black Rock, and it uh, requires the council to consider any application to remove native or indigenous vegetation. So it's a, it, it, it's a pause. But unfortunately, when the council considers it, it often considers that, well, perhaps that's justified. And you have to have a method like that because sometimes these things are, Trees are placed in the close to the middle of the block, very small block, and people don't want to build very small houses on land that costs mm -hmm. at least two million. That's uh, what we're up against. However, there are still people who who feel uh, that they want to preserve things. They want to, that the environment's important. And the man who finally bought this block in Point Avenue, the two blocks, just had a different view. He's actually keeping the two-storey house, and he's actually planting vegetation on the other block. He's, uh, well, we'll wait to see what finally turns out like, but we're, we're very relieved. And uh, I wonder if we can just switch focus to the campaigns that you're running at the moment, where your focus is. Do you have anything on the go? Yes. Well, the, we have a set of campaigns, and one of our big ones that still lingers and th these campaigns never end in, in a sense because people want to come back and have another go mm. and uh, they might have missed out or they've had second thoughts and want to do something worse. <laughs> um, the, the, the one that it occupies most of our efforts at the moment is a campaign to uh, get a better outcome for dealing with large trees, canopy trees in Beaumaris, trees that uh, keep the atmosphere in summer within reasonable uh, temperature limits. We're well aware of the um, global warming and climate crisis. But mm -hmm. Bayside City Council has declared that there is a, a looming cri climate crisis, but it doesn't seem to stop them uh, approving uh, areas of uh, their municipality being um, devegetated and concreted. Now, our argument is a pretty simple one, straightforward. How can you uh, improve the climate and uh, mitigate future concerns, which have gone right around the world. It's not just <laughs> conservation. You've probably heard about uh, it being a very big issue internationally. Uh, that everyone's got to do the bit. And converting uh, any area of land unnecessarily to pave pavement when you have trees already there is uh, not recommended. So we've had to fight them one by one. The Victorian government has introduced a really nasty planning provision to override that even further, and that is that it's only one tree. They have a quick approval mechanism, which almost always allows one tree, just one tree. Just one. Right. Yeah. Now, lots of people, because the blocks are small, have only one significant tree, so no problem in dealing with that. However, we're trying to draw it to public attention and we're trying, our campaign is to have that state of affairs uh, greatly improved so that we, we can be sure that uh, this area we, we uh, champion won't be unduly devegetated. We're not expect we're, no one's got the fantasy that it's a national park or that. Uh, People shouldn't be allowed to live in Bamaris. We all live in Bamaris. Uh, we're a local conservation society. But we believe there are limits. We want to live in conjunction with mm -hmm. the of nature. We'd like to see a few birds occasionally. Not everywhere, but just a 
enough to uh, be well balanced. Jeffrey, is there any other campaigns that you would like to talk about or any other areas in Bo Morris that you'd like to draw people's attention to? Well, there are particular types of tree. We, the people obviously don't want to just attack all trees, but if, if there is a distinction drawn between trees, the trees that are uh, the, the most impressive, the most uh, long-lasting, are often indigenous trees. The idea of planting things that uh, are likely to fall over and damage your property uh, does seem pretty stupid, but that's what a lot of people have done. You would not believe, for instance, that people actually still plant Norfolk Island pines. They like the symmetrical mm -hmm. Growth of them now, they're, they're, although it's a, an Australian territory up the Pacific Ocean, it's not part of the Australian flora. It's certainly got nothing to do with Victoria or Bo Morris. And they grow huge. <laughs> and of course, when they topple over, or even before they topple over, people get, having planted them, realize they've actually invited a monster onto their property. They think they're nice when they're young, aren't they? Pretty. But you know, monsters start out as tiny things and conventionally take over. So it's we certainly don't uh, put an emphasis on those trees. However, there are big trees, and river red gums are one of the ideals uh, inland, and coastal banksias along the coast, as the name suggests. They're very impressive trees. I'm looking out at one now. Uh, it's much higher than my house. It's got enough room around it so there's not threat to anybody in a, a neighbouring house. I've got a, a managum on my property, which is sufficiently close to the front and the house is sufficiently set back that if it drops a limb, it's not going to damage the house. And um, we we know, of course, that un, in some weather events, that they can lose limbs and that's not good. So if you've got vegetation around them, that it can absorb that and you can replant that vegetation. You've still got a nice uh, set and it's great for the bird life. Uh, there are, there's been a lot of a loss of some of those uh, outstanding specimens in Bamaros. Um, I mean, I re remember seeing destruction even as a child. I remember during the Second World War, and we were little kids on our bikes along the sandy road that was Reserve Road, watching the Australian Army during the war, though it had really real reason to get, practice their skills of blowing up manor guns. And they'd set charges at the base of these manor guns and these great majestic trees that had taken probably a century or more to, to reach their full height went way up in the air and crashed down again. It was really exciting for young children to see this, but I think we did reflect on it and realise well, all that was left was a, a mess. So that brings me to your membership. I know of, uh, sort of volunteer communities um, shrinking. Uh, how's your membership looking? Well, uh, it, over the years, and we had uh, nine years ago, we had our 60th anniversary celebrations. Congratulations. Yes, and it was we invited the the mayor and uh, uh, the local member of parliament came along, and a uh, local member member of parliament then actually mentioned this in parliament. It, it said it was worth mentioning. It's it's enhanced it now uh, that we had a 60th anniversary. Before that, we had a 50th, and I hope we might have a 70th next year, because in February 19, uh, February 1953 it was founded, and February next year will be 50 years later. Uh, membership has was small in the early days. It gradually grew, really became inactive in the uh, late 1960s. I suppose that victory over the ocean area might have exhausted people a bit. Um, th these campaigns do, you know, they rise up and people say, oh, we've won that, all, all should be well, we don't have to do anything mm -hmm. about it. It's not true. Um, anyhow, back... 
1970, it started off again with a flourish, and uh, the 1970s were quite a time for that sort of thing. Um, the uh, membership continued to uh, be fairly modest, and then we had what's often referred to as the Kennett era. Uh, Kennett was a prime liberal prime a liberal premier of Victoria, and he uh, decided that development was what he wanted, and he uh, was given open slather by his party, and the um, whole idea of uh, cramming more development on blocks and uh, allowing almost anything took root. Then he decided that he needed to amalgamate council. So instead of doing what happened in other parts of Australia where they simply amalgamated the councils and still had elected councillors, um, Kennett dismissed all the elected councillors. One of them was one of our members. He was pretty annoyed about that. Um, simply dismissed them and appointed commissioners of his own choosing, his uh, government's choosing. Uh, they weren't elected by the ratepayers or the people who paid the rates. Uh, that went on for several years. Uh, people got despondent. They, they had nobody to turn to. The commissioners that were in a, acting for the government, not for the citizens. And our membership fell down to 17, which was about the lowest it's ever been. Uh, so a reaction to this started, and people started to think, well, look, this man Kenneth can't be allowed to go <laughs> and do this uh, to our muni municipality and to our metropolis. And he eventually lost office. He was defeated by an uh, incoming Labor Party, which uh, said it would be more prudent. and and turned out to be under a man called Brax, Premier called Brax. Uh, our membership towards that latter stage of the Kennedy era, when they decided something had to be done, was galvanised by a very, very active and uh, uh, competent president, and we zoomed up from 17 to over 1,000. Now, since then, our membership has gradually gone down to around about 200 or just below. That's our present situation. And who knows what will happen in the future. Campaigns that really draw public attention do gain membership, as we did with the Beaumont Secondary College, when a large number of trees there were unnecessarily removed to allow a cricket ground. The cricket ground wasn't for the school. It was for the Melbourne Cricket Club. Uh, and it, it, it removed some of the ideal, the major, major trees, which were river red gums. And we saved some by arguing and making a case, um, probably saved about 15 or 20, something like that, but um, it was threatened the Long Hollow Reserve, and that got people out. We had uh, people out in the streets, and um, we greeted the chainsaw people with uh, vociferous objections. However, um, people soon forget those things, and uh, it's the stayers that matter. Yes, yeah, so just to be able to keep your call going um, is is quite something. Jeffrey, and, uh, is there anything else you'd like to talk about? Highlight? Well, we welcome new members. Uh, we keep getting new members. Of course, we also lose members. Members. Uh, leave or uh, they get old and die. <laughs> um, yes. <laughs> that keeps happening. Uh, so we keep recruiting. We're, we're fairly stable, but we're always uh, confronted with uh, new uh, proposals which often take no account of uh, the uh, lessons that should have been learned from previous things. And we keep keep pointing out to all those new councillors who haven't heard anything and some of them think they're coming in to uh, get the place going again. <laughs> and is there anything on the horizon vis-a-vis -vis Bo Morris, um, 
conservation that is worrying or that you'd like the public to be alerted to? I think the 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 biggest thing that we're, as I said earlier, our biggest campaign, the thing that is fairly critical is this vegetation protection overlay and making it uh, more serious and significant. At the moment, it just gives us a, a pause and, a, and a, a, not, a little time to make our concerns feeling, but you're fighting them one by one. What we want is a, a more serious uh, piece of legislation that actually guarantees uh, space for trees because without um, habitat, you don't get trees. And that extends, of course, to below the ground and for the solar. Um, you've got to have sunshine access. You've got to have uh, freedom from shading. And all those things make life hard for trees. But we... Uh, we keep uh, pointing out the advantages of the uh, improving that legislative protection. We ha had one interesting uh, gain, uh, not only be a quarter acre block, but there was an area of land still there, just north of the Bumaras Concourse, where uh, we found, and somebody looked up and found this is actually zoned for a future car park. We don't want that area of bushland to be turned into a car park. It's it, it's, it's still there, corner of Agnes Street and Reserve Road, quarter acre block, and we want that zoned for um, conservation. And we achieved that. We got the, the council unanimously agreed to it. They submitted it to the minister, oh. who was then a Labor minister, and he approved it. So it's now part of the Bayside planning scheme. Likewise, with the uh, an area which is quarter of a hectare at the Bamaras Concourse, called the Concourse Green, which at the time we were campaigning consisted mainly of trees and grass, and people could walk over it and enjoy it, the shade, and just the, the landscape aspect of it. There's a great contrast to the commercial ugliness that uh, is nearby, and all the cars and roads. And, usual clutter. It, it makes Bermorris Concourse quite distinctive. Now, that has been a, that was proposed to be eroded by various schemes to put paths across it to bisect it and uh, silly ideas about bringing granite boulders in for people to sit on. Well, we found out by having a petition which attracted over 800 signatures that people didn't want that. And council acted on it. Now, we fortunately avoided that, but uh, there's still extra pressures. People think, oh, we want more of this and that. And, that, and that. They just some people can't tolerate grass and trees. Seems. We just uh, trained to want uh, lawn and neat flower beds. Well, there's that aspect. Uh, but it's always a little bit. We don't want to, we don't want to demonstrate. We just want to put our little pet project here and then another one there. And perhaps a little bit. It's incremental, and it's this incremental creep yes. that's the biggest threat to a lot of these natural values. Yes, I think the, the residents around the Green Wedge find the same thing. Yes, that's right. That's a very good example on a larger scale. But even our foreshores are like that. Yes. I'm afraid there is something in uh, parts of the Australian uh, mentality that says, oh, we, they haven't got around to developing that yet. That that foreshore needs, there's room there. We could do marvellous things there. Uh, people could uh, put a car park and park their cars there and look out over the water. Mm. And those nasty trees stop us uh, getting... Uh, Our view. Views. And... and of course, what they don't realise, they also give a lot of protection against the prevailing cold, blustery winds mm -hmm. much of the year. And in, in, uh, you, you get strong easterlies and strong southwesterlies coming across Port Phillip Bay, which the Foreshore Reserve does give yes. real protection to. Well, Jeffrey, I thank you so much for the time, for your time this morning. Really appreciate it. Learned a, a lot that I didn't know about. Bo Morris and Bo Morris Conservation. 
and your your society has done a, a great deal of good over the years and i hope you continue to be able to do even more good and save more trees and more areas for conservation thank you megan we we would agree with that <laughs> we hope so too